Hey guys, what's up? It's Jonathan. As you can see, this setup is a little bit different than what I normally do, but I thought it would be fun to take you behind the scenes with some of the other work that I do at Dance Place. If you don't know already, I work part-time at Dance Place I'm on the marketing team as a marketing associate. So I manage and create content for all of our social media there. Dance Place is a nonprofit arts organization based in DC where we uh, present a lot of dance performances. We have dance classes for both adults and kids. We have community outreach programs. We do a lot of things in the the community to support the dance scene both uh, locally nationally and even internationally so it's a really awesome place I love working there I love the people to promote our upcoming season for 2019 2020 I created this trailer that highlights and announces all of the artists that will be performing at dance place next year as I was making it for the past two months ish I would show little snippets of what I was doing on my Instagram and people really liked it so I thought why not do a more in-depth video to show people how this whole video was created just to clarify this is not an in-depth tutorial on every single thing I did but as someone that was self-taught for the most part I spent hours looking up tutorials on YouTube to learn how to do all these different things and so I'm hoping that by making this video I can give someone that little tip like oh that's cool okay, here's what I need to search now, now that I know what that is, or here's how I can do this little thing, or this helps me think of how to go about creating this a little bit differently. So I hope this helps in some way, or it's just cool to see, you know, all the work that went behind this, because I love learning how things were created. Also, like I said, a lot of this was self-taught, just figuring it out as I went. So if you know of a better way to do something that I'm gonna show you, please leave it in the comments below. I am always trying to learn how to do things better and more efficiently. And if you are only interested in a specific part of the video, go to one of these times to check it out. This is gonna be part one, where I'm gonna talk about figuring out the concept of the video and capturing the content, and then part two will be the editing part. So stay tuned for that. If you haven't seen the video yet, go check it out on the Dance Place account on YouTube or IGTV, and let's get into it. All right, so when we first started, just to clarify, I'm not part of the cur 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 words. I can't say it. curatorial process. So I had nothing to do with looking at applications, figuring out who would be in the season. After the curio wow, words. After the curatorial team had decided on the artists for the next season, then our communications director, Amanda, came up with more detailed specifics about what the Amplify season would look like. She explained it to me, we talked it through, and then she's the one that had the original idea of what the trailer would look like. We thought starting in black and white and ending in color would work really well. We had done that last year with our Discover season, and it read beautifully. It was really cool to see that shift. It was really dynamic, so we liked it, so we wanted to keep that somehow. And Amanda had thought of a script that she wanted to use, and so we kind of went for this like Nike ad, really dramatic feel in the beginning. And we started drawing out a rough storyboard, so saying like, here's the script, and then for this phrase, we want this kind of shot. And at first, it was actually pretty abstract. We were thinking there would be maybe a close-up of an eye, and then a body part, but then maybe like a water drop or something running past. And then it slowly shifted to being really just um, focusing on the dancers. And during this phase I think maybe every other day we would meet back up talk through it again something would change and it just kind of kept going and evolving like that until we got to the actual film day and we were like okay it's locked in now we can't change it again and as we were talking about the word amplify and the concept of amplifying artist voices who maybe don't always have a platform and the idea of sound waves and um, microphones which kind of got cut from the concept but sound waves really stuck with me and so this idea of circles rippling out from a center uh, started to come into the works so that's where you see some of that in the animations and an initial idea that Amanda had for graphics was this like breaking up of an image with blocks and shapes and that's where the idea of the building coming apart in the middle to reveal the artists inside dance place that's how that originally came about going into shooting the content we knew uh, we needed a time lapse we knew we needed footage of dancers we knew we needed to compile footage of all the artists that were going to be in the season, and we needed to record voiceovers for the script. Also going into this, I had never really done time lapses before, and I had never done animations in After Effects like that before. I have done a lot of work in After Effects, but I've never done that like line drawing effect. I knew it was possible. I had kind of looked at some tutorials before and I thought it was doable. So then uh, those were both ideas that I kind of put on the table and was like, hey, I think this would be really cool to do. 
And personally, I wanted to try them and challenge myself and just learn some new techniques. So for a time lapse, I did a lot of research. I shot it on my Canon 5D Mark IV, which has a built-in intervalometer. So basically I can set it, tell it how many shots I want it to take and how many seconds between each shot. So with my 5D Mark IV, I used a 16 to 35 millimeter lens and I wanted something wider because then it allowed me to get closer to the building, it makes it look larger than life. Versus if I shot this on a more telephoto lens, it would be more compact, it wouldn't have that same effect, it would look like it was smaller and further away. It took me like four or five tries to get the time lapse right. I would try something, it didn't work, I would go home, research, try to figure out what I did wrong, try it again. Okay, something else didn't work, try it again. Originally I wanted to try to do a sunrise time lapse on the building, which is still on my bucket list, but it was just too much work and eventually I realized what was more effective was getting clouds moving over the building. But even that took a couple of tries because I would show up, there'd be no clouds, and so I would have to cancel and figure out the next time I could do it. And with clouds, the tricky part was getting enough clouds in the sky where you could see them moving, but not so much that it would keep moving in front of the sun and really changing the exposure on the building. And I got really lucky with this final one that you saw in the trailer. There were lots of clouds, it was beautiful, but none of them ever really moved in front of the sun, which was amazing. Because I knew I wanted cloud movement, I shot everything at a two second shutter speed, f2.8 and ISO 100 with a four second interval. And I did this for like maybe a thousand shots because I wasn't totally sure how long of a time lapse I would need. And because I had to drop the aperture and shutter speed down so much, I had to use a neutral density filter, which is basically like um, sunglasses for your camera. So because I'm letting in so much light with a slow shutter speed to get that like flowy cloud movement, it was way too bright. So I had to put this on top, which changed the color a little bit. So I shot in raw so I could change the white balance later in post and fix anything that I needed. This took an hour and a half to two hours sometimes. So I would grab a chair and I would sit next to my camera and you could hear the clicking as it happens but for some reason people I guess assumed I wasn't actually filming anything or taking pictures so they would walk in front of the camera and stand there and talk to me. I don't understand how that happens. So eventually I would just stand next to my camera anytime I saw someone walking by and then that fixed the problem. Lesson learned. But after I got all the shots I would go home, I put them into Lightroom, I would tweak the images the way I needed, then import them into Premiere Pro to turn it into a time lapse and speed it up however much I needed, which I'll show you in part two. Now to film the artists, I borrowed two LED panels from my friend Oliver. I knew I wanted a lot of shadows to get that sense of drama, so I put the LED panels behind the dancers, angled at them a little bit so they would get a little bit of wrap around their faces, but not a whole lot. So it really was focused on getting that silhouette feel. We had to do everything in two sessions just because of scheduling. So after the first shoot, I measured out where everything went, where the lights were on the stage, how they were angled, where the tripod was, what level the camera was, how far I was zoomed in, where the curtains were. So that way everything would be as consistent as possible. We had a super wide shot, we had a tighter shot, then we got a mid shot, and then we got some close ups of just the face. With every single artist, we would give them the same prompt. They would start with their eyes closed, head down, and the first couple beats, they would just take deep breaths, slowly moving like they were warming up. And then they would let that movement get bigger and bigger until it got to really full movement where they were jumping and you know, all that kind of stuff. We also asked them if they had any set choreography that they wanted to do because we found when they were improvising, the quality of the movement was just really different than when you have choreography that you already know. And also when we did the close-up shot of just the face, I would move the LED lights to the side of the face so we get a little bit more light. And then I actually used my cell phone light to shine on their face just to illuminate like this middle part. I knew everything would be in slow motion, so I shot at 60 frames per second, uh, 1 over 1 25th shutter speed, and then the aperture and ISO would change based on the number of people in the shot and uh, skin tones. After we were done filming the movement, then we would record them reading the script that Amanda had written. And to have everyone have roughly the same pacing, we recorded one of my coworkers, Allison, who is an actress. She's done voiceover work before, and she's the first voice that you hear in the trailer. We recorded her first with her going through the script at the pace that Amanda wanted. And so for the rest of the artists, we would let them hear that recording. I would play the recording on mute, but they could see the waveform. And that way they would see roughly how long each thing should take and they would try their best to match that timing. 
setup for that was actually pretty simple. It's what I'm using right now. We have a Shure SM58 microphone and a Zoom H6 recorder. They would just hold it in front of them and we recorded it like that in the dressing room at Dance Place. All right, well, that is a wrap for part one. Part two, we'll get into some of the editing stuff and how I put things together. But if you have any questions about the planning or the filming or the recording, let me know in the comments and I'll see you next time. And if you are, and if you are, and if you are, they're, they're the words. And if you are only interested in a specific part of the video, if you're interested in just one part of the video, and if, you, if you're interested, if you are interested in learning on, if you are interested in learning how I did a certain part of it, wow, words, I cannot talk fast.